Hello everybody, Assalamu alaikum. This is uh, Professor Abdullah Mutwalli, Supervisor of Nasija Academy, uh, Professor at Cairo University. Uh, now, uh, this is the second webinar from Nasija Academy for the year 2018. And we're glad just to uh, have with us uh, Professor Martha for the second experience with us and on giving a webinar. I think it's, it's very interesting just to have this webinar before Ramadan, so for everybody just we hope that this is, will be good and also winning uh, month for everybody. Uh, Ramadan Mubarak for Lil Gamiya, inshallah. Professor Martha, she's a full professor at Seton Hall University Library. She has extensive experience as a writer and also as an editor. Currently, she serves on editorial board of many well-known journals and library science like uh, Technical Service Quarterly and Journal of Electronic Resources Librarianship and International Information and Library Resources. Also, she is the uh, editor of the Journal of Archive Organization and uh, the most uh, interesting thing, she has uh, now a book. It will be on the market, I think, uh, recently by the coming September. Uh, it will uh, be, uh, I think, about the same one. It will be a librarian's guide to writing for publication and uh, based on that we select the topic of this uh, webinar hopefully everybody does get benefit on it and also we are encouraging you to look to uh, the agenda for Nasija Academy because there is a lot of events and also uh, grants action we can just support library and information centers in the Arab region. Uh, thank you again, and uh, I'll give a little the stage for uh, Marta. So please, Professor Marta, you can start the webinar. Thank you, Dr. Abdullah. First, I want to greet everybody um, in for Ramadan, which is coming up tomorrow, and also welcome you to this webinar, which is entitled Writing for Publication. Um, as Dr. Abdullah said, um, I have a, a long career both as a librarian, as a researcher, and as an editor. So I'd like to share with you some of my, um, my advice and suggestions for writing professionally for the field. Um, we're going to start by talking about peer review, because peer review is the essence of any uh, academic writing. Uh, we'll also talk a bit about uh, other kinds of writing, but this is really the core of what you're doing as an academic. Uh, before you can publish uh, an article in a peer-reviewed journal, such as um, Journal of Archival Organization, College and Research Libraries, um, any of the uh, English language peer-reviewed journals, uh, you need to know exactly what peer review is. Um, when you submit your article to a uh, editor, um, often through an editorial management system, uh, the editor then sends it out to peer review. And as it sounds, peer review means a review of your article by your peers. Uh, they're experts in the field. They're specialists, hopefully, in your area. So they are there not really to um, hold you back from writing, but to give you very useful feedback from their uh, experience. Um, writing is never uh, enough. You need to have a good editor to work with you. So uh, the first uh, step is the article is sent to the editor, editor-in-chief, who then sends it out for peer review. Um, these, they, it's sent out as a blind uh, submission, which means that the reviewers uh, don't know what your name is, so they can be uh, fair and, um, and give you a fair analysis. At that point, they do their critique. They look at your methods that you've used, uh, your validity of your methodology, and then they send it back with their recommendations uh, to the um, to the editor. Uh, at that point, uh, the editor um, either accepts the um, article for publication, rejects the article for publication, or ask that the uh, article be reviewed. And in my experience, uh, most uh, editors would like to have you rewrite the article to, get, to both for you and also for the for the, the journal, especially if you've picked an interesting topic. Um, I'd also like to comment at this point uh, that uh, if you have questions, which I'd be delighted to answer, um, you want to uh, wait to the end of the presentation, and I'll leave 10 or so minutes uh, for you uh, to, to, to ask them. 
Okay, what are the basic types of peer-reviewed uh, articles? Uh, there are actually uh, several of them, but I'm going to share with you now uh, four. Uh, the first one is called an empirical uh, study. An empirical study is a study in which a researcher collects and analyzes primary data. So that's the situation where you go out into the field, you collect evidence, which you then analyze at the end, and it's, prim it's looking at primary data. So that's one type of, of, uh, of uh, kind of journal article. A next uh, one is called a thesis study, and a thesis study is where a researcher begins with a hypothesis that he either proves or disproves. So you have a, a situation that you believe it may be one thing, and you do research, and then you either uh, find that it's so or, or not, and you write up your findings from that. Um, the next common kind of uh, article is called a compare and contrast article. And this is a article that's in the format of comparing and contrasting two topics where you demonstrate the similarities and the differences between them. And finally, um, there's a kind of uh, study called a case study, which focuses on one particular example, which then can be generalized. Um, I'd like to comment that these are four of the major types of peer-reviewed articles. However, they often overlap. An empirical study may also be a thesis study, and a case study uh, may overlap with a compare uh, and contrast article as far as the organization. But these are four main types. OK, I have here examples of each type. Um, these are really excellent uh, articles. Um, if you have a subscription to uh, Elsevier, to Science Direct, um, I think all of them can be found in there, or also, I think in SAGE has a couple of them. So the first one is a article, uh, as it's labeled, it's called an empirical study. Um, it's called a combined fuzzy SEM evaluation approach to identify the key drivers of academic library service quality in the digital technology age. You can see it's in a very well-known um, journal, of uh, the Journal of the Association for Information Science and Technology. So if you're really technically oriented, you'd want to go to a journal like this. Uh, the next one is a really a thesis statement. Uh, th has a thesis basis factors in influencing user satisfaction and loyalty. And again, another uh, kind of one that looks at hu uh, human information behavior, computers and in, for in, in, in human behavior, which you can also look at. Uh, the next one is uh, a, a historical comparison of trends in academic libraries, uh, compare and contrast. This is an art documentation, so if you're in that area, uh, this might be a good journal for you. And finally, a case study of collaboration in the building of China's library and information infrastructure. And I suggest that if you could also look how this kind of article is structured. It's about China, but look at how they've set that up and see if there are any things that you could borrow, get ideas from, and writing something similar about your own uh, library or a, a library um, that you can. An overview of the problem, a comprehensive literature review, a central thesis where you go through points one, two, three, four, and so forth, where you explain your thesis, a conclusion which wraps everything up, and then finally, your references and or your and and a bibliography. Um, generally, in our field, uh, the citation style used is APA, though it also may be um, Chicago. Okay. Generally, academic journals expect articles to be within a range of three thousand to six thousand words. So if you take the standard that generally 250 words equals one page of written text, 3,000 to 6,000 words constitute a 12 to 24 page article. And that's basically in the realm of what a academic journal peer reviewed article is consists of. Now, there are various ways of writing articles. Um, some people like to just barrel through and write it straight out. I think it's a lot easier if you do um, other ways of looking at the information. And I'm going to tell you now some of my tricks or ideas. One of them is to just simply look at the word count 
of how long the article you think the article should be. So let's say I have a topic on uh, a case study of my library's usage of uh, web analytics. So I would say to myself right from the start, um, I have over on the left my um, the, the things I know I have to put in that's not important. But we have here an introduction, so I would say that might be about one page, an overview, maybe two pages, a central thesis, 10 pages, a conclusion, two pages, and references, two plus pages for a total pages of 22 pages. OK, why am I doing that? I think it's much easier if you can try to segment an article into its parts so you don't have to work on everything at once. Um, if you know that you, your literature review, you want it to be five pages, OK, it may end up being six or four or seven, but then you have something to shoot for. So you can break out now these components and work on them individually. So I hope that makes sense to you. Uh, what uh, uh, section should you start with first? Well, this is my suggestion. You can, of course, start any way you want. You just have to, I think, remember that it's far easier to write an article if you break it up into sections. And if you're writing with a co-author, you can then very easily um, break that up as well between the two of you. Um, I would say that you should start, you could start with a literature review so that you get a really an, an overall understanding of what um, has been written in your field. One caveat is when you're writing a literature review, um, you, of course, are going to be as comprehensive as you can. But you also want to have as many new um, pieces of literature um, articles as possible. If you have a literature review where everything is very um, dated, it's, it's, not a, it's not going to support your argument. So I would start with that. Um, I would at the same time maybe do your references. You're doing the literature review. Organize your references uh, correctly. Uh, then I would do the overview. You're getting now an idea of what, what way you want to go with the topic. I would then at that point do the third thing, which is a central thesis, where you, now you've done enough work that you can just simply you know, combine them together, uh, figure out what your thesis is. And finally, end with the conclusion and end with, with the introduction. You never want to write the introduction at the beginning, because that's really what you learned, just like the conclusion once you've finished your research. Um, I hope that makes sense. Um, one thing to know that in our profession, the survey is the most commonly used method of gathering data for an LIS article. Uh, therefore, you need to decide on your research goals. Uh, you have to do a pretest your questions with uh, colleagues or students to find out whether they understand what you're asking them. Uh, you have to decide on a minimal sample size. So there's really quite a, a lot of work that goes into preparing to write an article, particularly if you are taking doing the case study method. Um, there are free tools that you can use, like SurveyMonkey. I've done a lot of uh, articles where I use that. Um, it's acceptable. Um, or proprietary tools like Qualtrics, which gives a much better um, analysis. Most of my articles that I've written have been written with descriptive um, uh, statistics. But if you are uh, very good at statistics, you can you certainly use any uh, method that you, you like. OK, this, um, just as a comment, you can submit to non-peer review journals uh, for a variety of w reasons, particularly if you are um, a library administrator. Um, it may be a, a good way for you to get your what your message or what you want to talk about out to a general public. So I would say to a, a not general public, but a public of your peers. So I would suggest that you look at um, journals like Library uh, Leadership and Information Management, where you're talking uh, administrator to administer or s administrator or something on that order. Um, you, of course, can look at new media as another way of supplementing what you're doing. Many people who are writers, they use a blog to uh, report on what they're writing. They do it in tandem or Twitter to announce your new articles or so forth, get information. So please take advantage of some of these new media tools. OK, how do you actually find your ideas for uh, writing a uh, an article, a peer-reviewed article, or any article, the first thing that you want to do is read. 
um, you should read the library literature as much as you can. You should also read other professional literatures and news and try to make a connection between the, uh, between the two. Um, library journals don't uh, operate in a vac vacuum, just like your articles don't um, operate in a vacuum. They pertain to a particular situation, so you want to bring in as much background information as you, you can as possible, at least be uh, familiar with it. Um, you can go and look at your conference presentations, your workshops, your poster sessions. Anything that you've written for work in a professional setting can be uh, reused for um, an article. Uh, repurpose what you've already written, for example, your uh, dissertation if you're an academic. Um, in our profession, it's quite common that people publish their dissertations as a form of articles instead of as a book. But maybe there's material that you um, looked at while you were writing your dissertation that you, you, you have, but you haven't used it. So take a look at that and see if you can uh, use that in another uh, article. Um, the last thing you want to do is examine your uh, job skills and responsibilities and ask yourself whether something you do, such as supervising or mentoring staff, doing instruction, product evaluation, or licensing uh, negotiations can form the basis of an article or presentation. And that's really important because we are a field of praxis. We are a field that reports on what we, what we do. And so if you have things that you're involved with, that makes a very, very good uh, germ, a seed of an article. OK, writer's tools. Um, I think it's really helpful to regard yourself as a writer, because you are. You're an author. Um, and you should act like, a, act like an author. Um, you want to keep a notebook to store your ideas. Um, that's very good just even being on the job. This can range from just an old-fashioned uh, notebook, like a school notebook, exercise book, to an app for your smartphone. I think it's very wise to keep a calendar or calendaring system to keep track of the due dates of all your writing projects. Um, you might try projects, uh, products like uh, Google Calendar, Microsoft Outlook, and Mecan, which works with Slack. Uh, you want to keep your articles very, or your uh, manuscripts very well organized in print or electronic folders so that you know what you're working on. Uh, many academics have not just one article going, they have several. And to get yourself organized in a way that you know where your material is, you know what your deadlines are, are very, very helpful. Um, some kind of a writing implement, a uh, tablet, an iPad, pay, pen and paper, whatever you prefer using. And it's also very helpful to have access to a citation program like EndNote, uh, Zotero, Noodle, and or a style management, uh, a style man, uh, excuse me, a style manual. So these are also free tools that you can get. Um, uh, Zotero is free and Noodle tools are free. So anything that can help you go and put your uh, references in the right format is useful. Um, I think that these tools are also very good for just, just life. When you're working at an academic library, when you're teaching at a, um, a library school, you, you have ideas that often come to you and just sort of disappear. So go and write them down, keep them in order, keep them as an inspiration for you for when you um, want to start writing. OK, the writing process. <clears throat> Um, it seems, when we talk about writing, that it's just simply sitting down there, um, doing a little research, uh, not a little bit, doing your research, and, and just simply writing out. That's really far from the tool, uh, truth. There's a lot involved in writing that has nothing actually to do with the actual process of writing itself. So some of the things that writers do to help them get organized and get going is pre-writing. Pre-writing means brainstorming, using a concept map, an outline, anything that kind of taps into that left side of your brain before you even begin writing to give you a general idea of what, what, what is important to you. Um, it's, I think, an absolute mistake to sit down with a preconceived notion about what you want to write about and just sort of write through. You, you want to really give yourself in the beginning a lot of creativity to come up with the right, you know, what's kind of percolating inside you and what you want to write about. 
Uh, the next thing that you want to do is really get yourself organized. Um, writing projects often consists of many different parts. Uh, you might be doing interviews. But you might be co uh, co uh, collecting a survey, giving a survey. Some of the tools that you can use are things like a Gantt chart, which charts out for you electronically um, what you need to do that particular week or that particular month. Uh, you can just even do it on a piece of paper. I often just take a piece of paper and divide it up at like a table and just write down all my deadlines um, that way and just work through a piece of paper. Okay, re research. Research is the basis of all writing. Um, it takes time. You want to do bibliographic searches. Um, you may have to do interviews or surveys. So again, you want to when you're charting out your article, you want to think about all those pieces that are going into making it a good, high-quality article. Writing, um, again, you're going to do a first draft, a second draft, maybe even a third draft. And perhaps the most critical of all, you want to take your article when it's finished and share it with colleagues and get feedback. Um, you'd be amazed how many times uh, you write something that's very clear to you, but when you show it to other people, they, you haven't explained it in a way that they understand. So it's really critical uh, to um, share your finished or your, your final draft with um, other people, with colleagues who, um, who are involved in, in library science. OK, there are examples of opening sen sen sentences of sequential paragraphs. Uh, why am I putting this in? I'm putting this in because often it is um, often a, an actual uh, article is composed of paragraphs. And why is this important? Often you have um, a, a situation where you have a lot of ideas and you can't really get them all strung together correctly. Um, there's something just wrong in their organization. If you take those, your writing, your peer-reviewed article that you're working on, and you break it up into paragraphs, um, then you can see that they can be moved around and that you can connect ideas by transitional phrases and conjunctions. So you can say, therefore something happened, then, you know, then it occurred. For example, uh, first, second, third, on the other hand, instead. So those, are, those transition words, transitional words, are what connect one uh, idea, one paragraph to another. And I'm going to show you, I'm going to go back one slide. This is from one of the articles that I um, suggested that you looked at. Um, the opening sentence of a sequential. Sequential means in order paragraphs. Now I turn to the question. As for the 173 individuals who subscribed, a second approach to building a collective of participating libraries, while this article seeks to demonstrate. So you can see that these are all set up in a way to lead you as a segue into uh, the paragraph. Um, the editorial process. So far, we've talked about writing and what makes it uh, easier for you to write. And we're basically looking at you as one part of the, the puzzle, but there is more. Um, as I had mentioned in the beginning, the editorial process is equally as important as the writing process. Um, my belief is that um, an article can always be made better by um, good peer reviews, uh, good peer reviewers, and a good editor. Um, this is critical, and um, that's what makes an article worthy of peer review. So let's take a look at the editorial uh, process. Okay, um, who does what? Um, involved, uh, the editor um, is just one component of a uh, the whole process. You have the publisher. These are definitions. A company or person engaged in publishing. You have the editor, a person who edits written materials for publication, a person in overall charge of the edi uh, editing, a person of charge of, of one section of a newspaper or a periodical, periodical of course, is journal. Editorial board, an advisory board that may suggest policy and editorial content for a journal or book series. Uh, I am on the um, advisory board, editorial board of Journal of Electronic Resources, uh, and also on uh, Technical Services Quarterly, and also on International um, Information and Library Resources. And often the people who are on the editorial board also serve as peer reviewers. So I do peer review for all those um, journals. 
a blind review. That, that's another way of saying a peer reviewer. Um, I talked about that earlier. It's a reviewer who evaluates a manuscript from which the writer's name and contact information has been removed. Uh, the copy editor is a person who prepares the manuscript copy for printing, um, makes sure that the style is consistent, corrects any errors, asks questions about um, comments that you may have made that um, he or she is not um, sure about. So there are a lot of people besides the editor who are involved in working on your peer review article. Okay, what is the process of publication? Uh, the process of publication is that an editor receives uh, journal submissions in a variety of ways. Uh, these are the three most common. Um, the editor may put out a call for a special issue of a journal, and the writer then prepares a short proposal or full-length article geared to the particular theme the editor has selected and submits it. And I'm sure that you have seen yourself calls on various lists that you subscribe to saying that an editor is doing a special issue on the topic of um, library access to um, serials. And then uh, you, you've read that uh, the call, you know that you can write a great article on that, and you put a proposal forward to the editor who then gets back to you and says, yeah, I'd, I'd really like to see that. That seems really relevant to the topic of our special journal. Uh, another way um, that an editor receives material is he may commission work uh, directly from an author. So he may have been at a conference presentation that he feels that the that lends itself to treatment as an article. He may have read something the article the author has written in another journal. He may uh, contact an author based on a conversation or shared committee work, recommendations from a colleague. Um, if he's at a poster session, he may go up and ask, uh, talk to the people. One of the kind of the secrets about publishing, about the editorial process, is that the editor is always looking for new material, always. So um, it's not just that the editor acts as a gatekeeper, the, act, the editor is actively uh, soliciting new material for the, the journal. Um, the last way that a writer can, uh, uh, can, an editor can receive a journal submission is just simply that a writer approaches an editor about um, a topic or submits a manuscript uh, directly to the journal without any previous contact, and this is called a cold submission. Um, all of them are perfectly valid ways of um, submitting to a journal. Um, if you do a cold submission, uh, you want to make sure that you have presented yourself in a way where the editor knows something about you, whether through a cover letter or some kind of um, description of your work. Um, you know, anything that sets you apart, that tells the editor, you know, uh, who you are, uh, why you are um, an expert in this particular topic is, is good. Okay, there are many, many uh, journals out there, especially in the electronic environment. And before you pick a journal, you want to make sure that it is a legitimate journal. Um, there are m several journals out there that uh, appear to be very shady. They, um, you, you don't know what they are. That's not the kind of journal you, you want to submit to. You want to submit to a high quality, well-known uh, or uh, emerging uh, journal that is going to market and present your work and be part of a legitimate process. So how would you go about doing that? I mean, of course, you have a list of names of uh, peer-reviewed journals uh, that you know of that are the top peer reviewer, uh, peer journals, peer-reviewed journals. Uh, but at the same time, there are many newer journals that might be, that are peer-reviewed, that might be really appropriate for what you're doing. For example, one on uh, emerging technologies. So you have to look and see with the journal what the focus is, uh, you know, what, how is it serving your needs, not just you serving the editor's needs. Okay, so if you go online and you're looking for journals, you know, to see whether it is legitimate, what are you going to do? Who publishes the journal? So you want to look at the uh, About page. Uh, who, who, does it have an editorial board? Uh, who is the publisher? Um, mission statement, whatever, see, take a look very carefully at the journal, uh, journal's about page and see what that journal is. 
what is the journal citation factor? Um, citation factors are really done in a number of different ways. One is by the journal itself. One is by the article. Uh, one is by um, a series of criteria that are set by library ed uh, educators, a uh, set of criteria that are set by um, library administrators. So you want to go and very carefully, very tactically, look at journals and see which one uh, satisfies what you want to do with your article. OK, this is, I think, really critically important. Uh, you want to go through back journals uh, of uh, a particular journal and look at the kind of articles that the journal publishes. Okay, So many, especially if you have electronic submissions, just go through and look at the abstract, look at the titles of the articles so that you can go uh, through them and get a sense of what the journal is about. Um, even though uh, something like college and research libraries, uh, which I'm a uh, peer reviewer for, um, a very uh, high quality journal, but it went through a change of editors and what is interesting to one uh, editor or is not interesting perhaps to another. Uh, the editor-in-chief. So, you know, people are, editors are people too, so you want to see or try to figure out what are the articles that appeal to that particular uh, editor-in-chief. Okay, another thing is how long will the journal take to publish your article if it is accepted? If you are an academic and coming up for tenure, perhaps you do not want to be uh, waiting for a year or two years to have your article uh, addressed. So you know, keep that in mind. Look at what the publisher, sta uh, publisher says on his website, the journal, and see how long the journal is. Is the journal uh, open access? Um, that is important to some people and not to others. If it's open access, one of the um, good things about that is that it allows uh, your article to be accessed by many more people because it's open access. On the downside, many uh, universities do not accept um, open access journals, uh, or they do not value them in the same way that they value um, journals that are not open access. Uh, lastly, can you place a preprint in your library e-repository? Um, that, again, is very important to some people. It's important to a university. It's important to you, again, as a way of getting your information out there, what, what you are doing as a writer. OK, definition of gold and green um, access. Um, there are various models of open access, uh, just so that you know, uh, uh, understand that the two major models are a gold open access. It's a journal where it's at least partially based on subscriptions and only provides gold open access for those individuals' articles for which their authors or their author's institution or funder pay a specific fee for publication. And that's often referred to as an article processing charge. Then there is green open access, uh, refers to the practice of depositing articles in an open access repository. Uh, this can be an institutional or disciplinary repository. So two models, one gold uh, access where either the author or the his institution pays to have um, that article made open access, or green where the uh, article me immediately goes up and is read. I think all the ALA publications are like that. OK, preparing to submit your article. What you really want to do is read the guidelines for submission and then go back and read them again. This is really critically um, important when you are submitting a peer-reviewed article. Uh, what is the citation style? Are they using APA? Are they using something else? Does the journal use footnotes or endnotes? What is a typical article length? Um, what font should the article be in? Should figures be submitted separately? It sounds um, maybe not so important, but it's critically important because if you don't do it, the editor is not going to do it for you. He wants to get a manuscript that is in good condition that he can just simply read and um, uh, you know make a decision on. Address the editor formally. I don't think this is a problem for um, most people, but sometime with younger people, um, you you. Address them as dear doctor, dear mister, dear ms, your editor. You never address them as hi. And you want to check your spelling and grammar for US publications. Use US, not British forms of words, i.e. analyze with a Z and not analyze with an S. OK, questions an editor asks. So now I'm, I'm turning the tables and I'm looking what I ask 
in fact, uh, as an editor when I get a manuscript. Okay, what is the word count of your piece? If you've submitted something that is five pages long as a peer-reviewed article or 100 pages long, um, this is not going to fit in my journal because it's just the page length is, is not right for a, for a journal. Is the topic appropriate for a journal? If I am writing, uh, my journal is Journal of Archival Organization. If somebody submits something to me on reference uh, questions, that topic is not appropriate to, for the journal. And I'll ask myself, uh, why didn't the, the author go and take a look at the guidelines and see, you know, they, they're just submitting it to me blind. Okay. Is the style of writing appropriate for a journal? Um, I had an article submitted uh, that was quite interesting, but it was in a totally inappropriate, familiar uh, form uh, that I didn't feel was appropriate for the journal. So watch how you are writing to make sure that it corresponds to the kind of language that, uh, that, the, uh, that runs in the journal. And lastly, has a similar article run recently? If you write a stunning article on, um, I don't know what, on a topic that I just had an article run in my last journal, unless your article is in dialogue with the other one, I, I most likely am not going to write it because in a to, to run it because in a journal you want to have many different types of article to keep the interest of the readers of the journal. So look at, again at the table of contents, go through back issues, and see what the editor is looking for, what topics may be interesting that have not been covered, and so forth. Okay, more questions about what an editor is. Looking at the manuscript uh, just as itself, the editor asks himself, has the author satisfied the premise established in the lead paragraph of the article? This is the introduction. And that's why I said it's often good to write the introduction last or towards the end when you know what the article is about. If you come up with a premise that has really nothing to do uh, with what actually unfolds in your article, that's you have to change the, the introduction. Okay, an editor will ask, if you're using statistics, have the statistics been interpreted correctly? If you've conducted a survey, are the results meaningful? Um, this is really one of the uh, real bugbears of um, uh, writing library, uh, peer-reviewed library articles. Many of them use surveys. But many of them use a survey, but the, what they're looking at is not meaningful. So even though the survey may be beautiful, may be analyzed beautifully, if the topic is not of interest, current, fresh, uh, interesting, uh, it's it's not worthwhile. It's not mm, the survey does not add to the to the what you want to talk about. Um, if the author has done a literature review, is it adequate? Um, I, I talked about that a little bit earlier. That. Um, you want a li literature review to be up to date. If the sources you cite are from the 1990s and so forth, that's not a good literature review. It's a very, um, either you've picked a, a topic that is not kind of happening right now, or you need to do another uh, literature review. Okay, the last question an editor asks himself is, does the article need extensive revision? If the article needs so much work, um, the article the editor may reject it just because it would require too much work to redo. Now many, um, or at least some, academic journals will take on a mentoring role for um, writers who are writing their first peer-reviewed article and they would like um, comments and feedback. And that's great. I know the College and Research Libraries does that. I think the other ALA publications, we do it at Journal of Archival Organization. Um, People will work with other with the pra practitioners and archives to write articles, but you know if you get something that is so needs so much work, most likely the editor will not will just send it back to you. Okay, improving your chances of publication. Take a look again at the table of contents that you would like to submit to. Can you engage in a dialogue with a controversial article that has run recently? Editors want to publish intelligent, well-written articles that provide different viewpoints. Can you provide an international perspective on a major event shaping the prof profession, say, data preservation? Can you provide information on a new form of library services unique to your library or region? 
Um, here are some examples of journal publishers, Taylor & Francis, Elsevier, Sage, Emerald, Society of American Archivists, there are library associations, library publishers, university libraries, open access publishers. Okay, now I'm going to talk for a few more minutes about common problems with international submissions to U.S. journals. The first is that the topic is uh, out of date. This particularly has to do with technology. If you're writing about a technological situation at your library where um, it's not current, uh, most likely in an English-based, uh, English-language publication, it will not be run. Okay, the author doesn't understand the difference between a literature review and a bibliography. They're very different. A literature review provides a summary, analysis, a narrative involved. Um, it's not just simply a listing of one uh, bibliographic resource after another. Uh, this is something that I am really um, strong about. Uh, there's not enough background information or context. If you provide to me a survey where I know nothing about the library, I not, know nothing about the situation around the library, um, it's just an academic exercise. Um, so what I would like from authors Tell me something new. Help me learn. Explain to me why your situation is unique. Tell me something about your country, about your region. Um, I would find that fascinating to get a background so that I could put what you're writing in context. OK, I'm going to give here two uh, examples. One is article submission number one. Uh, the author, an educator at a university in the Arab region, does a survey of the library academic websites of a similar institution. This methodology consists of personally examining uh, each website and answering a series of questions on a checklist. His conclusion is that major improvements need to be made to these sites to make them more user friendly. Pluses and minuses of submission uh, number one. It's well organized. It follows a typical format of a compare and contrast article. The literature review was well integrated. The English was grammatically correct. However, although the article works on a structural level, the analysis is weak. In addition, technology has advanced further than that described in the article. The author's literature review is out of date and should focus on user experience studies rather than an overall survey of sites. Author did not follow style guides, need to redo, decision, revise, and resubmit. Article submission number two. The, article, the author has conducted a survey of how resources are being managed at academic libraries in the Arab region using a statistical model that has been recently been developed by European Library Consortium. This thesis shows that there's a correlation between the size of the academic library and how well the resources are being managed. OK, in this case, it was well organized. It followed a typical format of a thesis uh, uh, argument, which we discussed earlier. He defined the uh, metrics and the questions very well. He did a sophisticated analysis. He did a current letter literature review. So the decision was to accept with minor uh, changes. Now, I, I do want to leave you some time here for questions. Um, the last part I'll get through very quickly is on how to negotiate a publishing contract. And I think what you want to do, my major takeaway is this page here. Read the contract. The agreement is legally bi binding. It's your right. You can modify the agreement. Maintain the rights to your article. Negotiate to be able to place a preprint in your institution's repository and negotiate to get all rights to your article returned after a specific period of time and decide whether green or gold access is right for you if it's relevant. So I'm going to stop here. These slides are going to be available to you later in the form of a PDF so you can go through them. Again, the last uh, parts are really about copyright, but I think it's more important now to have you ask questions to me and hopefully I'll be able to answer them. Uh, what I'd like you to do is to, under the chat, you should see a chat box um, and a line that says type here. So uh, ask me your questions. Uh, type them there. And uh, I'll read them so everybody can understand them. And then I'll answer verbally. Um, uh, Dr. Am uh, Amal asks, which is better for a starting author, green or gold access? Um, Mm, green or gold access is really dependent on really on what your university does. So if you're in the fields of the sciences, mo most likely your university will pay 
to whatever the fee is to have your article published as an uh, open access article. Um, green, you know, uh, green, are, as I said, um, I think all the ALA publications, college and research library and so forth are all open, totally open access. I think it's more important for you as a starting author is to look at the uh, library journals and decide which library journal is the right one for you to publish in. That's, that's much more important. Um, any more questions? Um, yes, I do present workshops for research projects. Um, I've taught, I have a book coming out, as uh, uh, Dr. Abdallah mentioned, on writing for uh, Librarian's Guide to Writing for Publication. And I have done workshops and courses on preparing uh, research articles, for sure. Um, I'd love it if other people have some more questions um, about anything that I talked about. Um, if you do, just go to the chat box and then write, you know, in the in the bottom. It says type here. Um, I think that, you know, one of the things that uh, I have noticed when I uh, look at articles from uh, the Arab, Arab, re Arab region is that um, what I would like to know as a uh, editor of a English language publication uh, international publication is really to find out what's what's happening in your uh, country, in your region that makes what's happening in the library um, of interest. I think that's really uh, something that would be very fresh, very new, not to present things that are just so kind of um, static and academic that it's just like looking at an exercise. Uh, that's one thing I would really uh, recommend because, for example, um, one of the articles that I uh, put in the list of readings, it's about um, an art uh, library publication. What an interesting topic if you could look at, if you're in that field, if you are in an, uh, an academic library that has um, an archives with art, if, you, if you're working on a, a beautiful new library building, if you are, um, you know, an art history slash library researcher, wonderful, interesting topics that I could learn from. And then if I know I can learn from them, my readers can too. Okay. Uh, Dr. Amal has a question. He says, does, uh, do Arab authors need to create research IDs in ORCID to increase the chance of acceptance? Uh, no. Um, it, however, it's a very good idea to, to do. You go to, um, I've forgotten what the URL is for ORCID. But you go there, you create a, a, a profile for yourself. Um, ORCID is really good with the movement going towards uh, linked data, because you will have a permanent um, uh, identifying number that refers to you. So that will be the same thing as having a Library of Congress um, author, you know, uh, author, uh, author file, authorial file um, in the past. So I really um, encourage you to do that. Um, I know that, uh, I don't know what's happening with them now, but there are various uh, mm, uh, companies like uh, research.org and so forth that you can go to to create a profile for yourself. I think anything that advertises you that people are looking for is a, is a good thing. Um, but no, you don't need to have an ORCID idea to submit um, um, articles to a journal. Okay. Um, Dr. Abdallah has asked me to talk a little bit about the cost for publishing. Um, I've actually never published uh, an article that I have uh, paid to have published. Um, I think that that is a situation uh, generally found in the sciences, and I think it's something that's paid for by generally by a university. Um, again, this is really... Uh, from what I understand, it can be quite expensive. It might be something like $1,000 to have your article uh, published and become immediately open access. And I understand why the publisher might feel that way because, you know, it costs a lot to prepare a, a, a journal and somebody has to pay for it. Um, I would suggest that in the beginning when you start to write that you don't look either you don't look at uh, gold access as a way of publishing. You go and look for the best journal that fits what you want to do. Um, to me, that's the most important. And most journals will not uh, ask you to, to pay a fee. Um, Dr. Abdullah also asks, what about the journal you are on the editorial boards? None of them um, are, as far as I know, gold uh, 
I, uh, gold, I think what they all have is uh, agreements where the, um, the author can deposit a copy into the, their e-repository, one copy, I think it has to be a preprint, and later after a certain amount of time uh, they can do anything they want, I believe, with that particular article, because articles have currency and after a certain point of uh, time it, they're not really useful. They're not, not that they're not useful, but they're not worth as much as they were right when they were cutting edge. I do know that the College, uh, uh, College and Research Libraries publishes everything open access. And again, the point of having things open is that more people will get to read what you've, uh, what you've written, which is a plus. You know, the whole point of research is to disseminate it and share and have new knowledge made. Okay, so um, I think we're coming to a close of our session. Um, I'll see what else Dr. Abdullah has to say. Um, I want to thank you so much for participating in this webinar. Um, I hope you will, you, you may reach out to me if you have uh, questions. Um, that's, that's, that would be wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Amal. Thank you. And I think everybody just thanks us. I hope if we have any other question for Dr. Marta, we still have a few minutes. Thank you. Thank you for attending. Thank you for everybody. And uh, also I'm encouraging you just to Stay tuned for um, the, the upcoming book for Dr. Marta. I think it will be an interesting one. Uh, again, it will be uh, on the coming September 2018, inshallah. And for sure, it will be on Amazon and the publisher will be ABC, CLIO, Libraries Unlimited. And uh, uh, again, thank you, Professor Marta. And if you are, uh, don't mind, just would like just to have this presentation on even PDF uh, file, and also uh, we will uh, publish it uh, on the CJ Academy website. So if it's uh, fine with you, it will not uh, threaten the, the copyright for the book, because we just published the, the, the presentation. Okay? Thank you so much, Dr. Abdullah. Okay. Thank you so much. We uh, also invite you for the upcoming uh, webinar and also events on our site. Thanks again. Thank you, Professor Marta. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye.